<laughs> Good evening. Glad to be your speaker this evening. Have a study that comes from the book of 2 Kings tonight, but we're going to take a reading from 1 Kings. So if you will, open your Bible to 1 Kings chapter 16, and we will read verse, uh, starting at verse 29 here in just a moment. Uh, the interesting title that B talked about. I got it. It was inspired from an author named Del Davis, and I was reading a little section of his today on 2 Kings, and I thought, well, that's, I, I can't do better than that. <laughs> you'll, you'll understand. This heads will roll comes from a, a little story within the midst of 2 Kings chapter 9 specifically, but we want to introduce our thoughts with this little introduction to King Ahab. It says in 1 Kings 16 verse 29, in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. Now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And it came to pass, as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebet, that he took as his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians. And he went and served Baal and worshipped him. Then he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a wooden image. He did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. This is a turning point in Israel's history. And I don't mean to get ahead of our Old Testament study, but I, this has nothing really to do with our Old Testament study. It just so happens to be kind of close to where we're at. This is the outline of the biblical periods that we've studied up to this point in, in connecting the dots between where we are at and where this story is at. Uh, we've talked about, I think there's 15, if I'm not mistaken, biblical periods in the Old Testament. We've gone through all of these up to, we're about to start on the book of Judges. I think we'll start that in June. Well, I'm skipping down to the divided kingdom. And that is called that, the divided kingdom period of Israel's, of Israel's history, because during the reign of Jeroboam, he was mentioned in that text, he's kind of the archetype for evil kings in the nation of Israel. Well, he broke away. He led an insurrection against King Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, and that's when the kingdom divided and happened. From that time forward, it was always the northern kingdom of Israel had ten tribes in the southern kingdom of Judah, Judah and Benjamin, a very small tribe with it. So that's where we are in the history of Israel in the Old Testament. Now, I, I want to give a definition real quick to what is a word picture. I was... I think, did I make that up? So I looked it up today, and I didn't make that phrase up. It's been around for a while, the 1800s apparently. But a, a word picture is a description in words, especially one that is unusually vivid, dictionary.com says, the highest reputable source I could find. <laughs> but I really like that definition, the one that's unusually vivid. And sometimes, now, now, before I say this, this is really a sermon about hell or that standing for God's judgment. And instead of getting up here and giving a, a hullabaloo sermon of yelling about hell is hot, you know, people can do that, and they might say over and over, hell is hot, and that's the basis of their sermon. Uh, that, for me, is not as effective as a word picture, a word picture where a story in the Bible describes God's judgment in very vivid, unusually vivid details. And so what I want to give to you is a warning for you that have children, this is a rated R story. And I'm not joking. This is one of the most graphic stories in all the Bible. It's one that has captured my attention every time I read the Old Testament, this story, because of really how graphic it is. But if it gives you any solace and encouragement, I heard this story when I was an infant breastfeeding. I know I did because my family read through the Old Testament and we didn't hold it back as far as what we read. We just read it all. And I was never traumatized from reading this story as a child. In fact, there's, I, get, I thought about this, and I want to give you three reasons why I'm going to go ahead and teach this in the hearing of all these little ones. Well, maybe four. One, the ones that are too young to get it won't get it, and that's, they won't get it, okay? The second reason is that this story, along with all Scripture, was read in the hearing of the whole assembly of Israel, along with every other story in the Bible. Um, another reason is that a lot of you... Let your kids play video. I don't know this. Who? Who? I just know this happens in our society. You let your kids play graphic video games with violence that the gore of those video games outweighs anything we're going to read tonight. So there should be no comparison here. And then um, the the third reason or fourth reason, I guess, at this point, 
is that, um, you know, some people might raise the uh, disclaimer and say, well, we should appeal to God's, you know, love and his mercy and grace and all that. And this is really just something that isn't meant for the whole church to hear, or isn't meant for little ears to hear. If this story disturbs you and even makes kids a little scared of God, that's, that's okay. Kids need to be scared of God. They need to love him and respect him. They need to be scared of him. I'm, I'm terrified of God. And I need to lose some sleep thinking about graphic images of God's judgment. So if you're disturbed by this sermon and the words of 2 Kings 8 through 10, I hope you are. If you need to be, even better. And um, I don't really know what church council got in a room and decided that God's positive attributes were the only ones fit for the pulpit or fit for our sharing with one another. I don't know who decided that. It seems rather arbitrary. And so we're going to talk about really what's seemingly an unpopular side of God's character, and that is his divine wrath and judgment. And we're going to focus on it through the lens of how he acted and what he approved of in the story of King Jehu and his judgment of the house of Ahab. Now, that was a rather long introduction, but I wanted to get all that out of the way before we got into the text and into the grit. Now, if you'd like, you can turn your Bible to chapter 21 of 1 Kings. And um, if you don't have a Bible, I would highly suggest get one about now because we're going to do a lot of reading. Um, we're probably going to read two whole chapters of text at least. So if you don't have one, yeah, go ahead and get up and grab one across another bench. I'm reading from the New King James for all my texts this evening. So we introduced that King Ahab is the guy that's under focus. He's under the spotlight in, in this little story. But he's really not alive during the part that we're going to read about. So we have to ask ourselves, why is he important to this? Well, I just read to you 1 Kings 16, 28 to 32 introducing who he was and how he thought it was trivial the sins of Jeroboam so let me outdo you one or two more and build shrines to Baal well anyways in this uh, text here it's going to tell us exactly in more detail why Ahab was so bad I thought this little chart here was helpful before we get too deep into the study and I thought if you can remember the big fours then you can take away some of the key hitting facts and points of this Oh, it's a huge story that crosses many chapters of the Bible, and it's kind of hard to keep track of. So remember the big fours. In this study particularly, there's four chapters that will stay within primarily the main meat of our study tonight. 1 Kings 19, 1 Kings, I'm sorry, 2 Kings 8, 2 Kings 9, and 2 Kings 10. The four protagonists, those are the good guys. The four protagonists in this story are God. He's... Mentioned, but and, and oftentimes you might not even think that he would be a main character, but God's always the main character in the Bible story. And he's very he's more present than anybody, uh, really. Haziel is the king of Syria, the king of Syria. Now, Syria was a rising and present threat to the nation of Israel during all of this, uh, especially at this turning point in history. And Elisha was the servant of Elijah. Elijah's the one that went into heaven in the flaming chariot, and Elisha took his mantle and went back across the Jordan and went on to fulfill the ministry of Elijah. And then King Jehu is the king that we're going to discuss. Now he was king of, well, he will be anointed king of the northern ten tribes of Israel. Okay? Um, the antagonists are the bad guys. Now there's more than these, but these specifically are mentioned in our, our key characters. Baal, he's a false god. He isn't even a real person. He's just the figment of people's imaginations. The antagonist to God. Then there's Joram. Now Joram is the he is the uh, he's one of the sons of Ahab, but he is the son of Ahab who is currently reigning on the throne of Israel. When we get to the story, then there's Ahaziah. He is the king of the southern two tribes of Judah. He is the brother-in-law of Joram, the son-in-law of Ahab, by way of reference. And then Jezebel. If you've never heard of Jezebel, then you haven't gone to church much. Um, she is the most wicked woman in all the world. And she is used as the figure of wickedness in the book of Revelation to describe sexual immorality and idolatry. Okay, so those are your big fours in these three different categories. So as we get into this, here is an outline of the chapters 8 through 10. And we will get through the, all of this eventually. But let's first do a little bit more background study in 1 Kings chapter 21. And I want to read verses 20 through 24, a little bit more noting of King Ahab. It says there, 
So Ahab said to Elijah, we jump into the middle of this conversation between Ahab and Elijah. Have you found me, O my enemy? And Elijah answered, I have found you because you've sold yourself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring calamity on you. I will take away your posterity and I'll cut off from Ahab every male in Israel, both bond and free. This is God talking through the voice of Elijah. I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah, because of the provocation with which you have provoked me to anger and made Israel sin. And concerning Jezebel, the Lord also spoke, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. The dogs shall eat whoever belongs to Ahab and dies in the city, and the birds of the air shall eat whoever dies in the field. This is God's assessment of this wickedness between these two characters that have wedded themselves in holy matrimony, Ahab and Jezebel. The worst combo you could possibly fit into one room. Now we're going to jump back a little bit to 1 Kings chapter 19. And this is God's policy for how to bring about this judgment on Jezebel and Ahab. This is his enactment plan. Chapter 19, this is after... I've done a Bible story on my YouTube page of Elijah and the prophets of Baal, where they both make a sacrifice to their gods, and we'll see who wins out. And at the end of the day, Baal loses... Well, Elijah has to flee for his life from Jezebel. And that's where we are in the wilderness with Elijah as he's talking to God. In verse 15, this is God's enactment plan. Then the Lord said to him, Elijah, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Haziel as king over Syria. Also you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shephet, of Abel-Meholah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Haziel, Jehu will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So he has a three-part enactment plan, or a three-part uh, judgment policy. And these three characters, the ones on the chart before, uh, the middle column there, below God, Haziel, Jehu, and Elisha, are going to lead the charge of this judgment on the house of Ahab. Now again, when we get to 2 Kings, Elijah is gone, Ahab is gone. For two generations from Ahab, we're talking about the house of Ahab, his descendants, his posterity. But God is going to bring ultimate judgment on his posterity, and thus Ahab and Jezebel. Okay, so that catches us up to speed for now going to the book of 2 Kings. And so flip back over to 2 Kings. And uh, we'll start in chapter 8 to introduce Haziel. In the story of the sequence of these three chapters, this character Haziel is anointed king first. And we'll read about that. And as we go along, I'm going to paraphrase some. I'm going to read to you some. I'll, tell, I'll do a little storytelling. I'll just be honest. I'm not as familiar with this story in order to tell it dramatically as I am stories like David and Goliath and Daniel and Lions Den. So I, I'm going to have to make sure that we read some key phrases and maybe do more reading than storytelling. And so stay with me, and then we'll get to some interesting notes along the way. Okay, let's start at chapter 8 of 2 Kings, and in verse 7, this is part 1, Haziel. Then Elisha went to Damascus, and Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, was sick. And it was told him, saying, The man of God has come here. And the king said to Haziel, Take a present in your hand and go to meet the man of God and inquire of the Lord by him, saying, Shall I recover from this disease? So Ben-Hadad is currently reigning on the throne, and he's talking to Haziel, and he's telling Haziel, Go meet Elisha, or Elisha's servant. And so Haziel went to meet him and took a present with him of every good thing of Damascus, forty camel loads. And he came and stood before him and said, Your son Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, has sent me to you, saying, Shall I recover from this disease? And Elisha said to him, Go say to him, you shall certainly recover. However, the Lord has shown me that he will really die. Then he set his countenance in a stare until he was ashamed, and the man of God wept. And Haziel said, why, why is my Lord weeping? He answered, because I know the evil that you'll do to the children of Israel. Their strongholds you'll set on fire, and their young men you will kill with the sword, and you will dash their children and rip open their women with children. And... So Elisha does what God told him to do. He sends this messenger to go anoint Haziel as king of Syria. And in the subsequent verses, Ben-Hadad does die, just like Elisha said would happen. And Haziel is anointed the king. Well, he was already anointed king here. But he takes the throne actively. And Haziel is going to start taking land away from Israel. And he's going to start 
undoing the covenant of Abraham fulfilled in the book of Joshua. And because they have not remained faithful to the Lord's covenant, Deuteronomy 28 said this would happen. And this is the first enactment of God's holding to his covenant curses in Deuteronomy 28, taking the land back that they had previously been given. We jump now to verse 25, and here we are introduced to antagonist characters Joram and Ahaziah. Okay, they were brother-in-laws, king of Israel and king of Judah. In the twelfth year, verse 25, of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, began to reign. Ahaziah was 22 years old when he became king, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Athaliah, the granddaughter of Omri, king of Israel. And he walked in the way of the house of Ahab and did evil in the sight of the Lord like the house of Ahab, for he was the son-in-law of the house of Ahab. Now, he went with Joram, the son of Ahab, to war against Haziel, king of Syria, at Ramoth-Gilead. So there we go. Haziel is already attacking Israel. It has begun. And the Syrians wounded Joram. Then King Joram went back to Jezreel to recover from the wounds which the Syrians had inflicted on him at Ramah, when he fought against Haziel, king of Syria. And Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, went down to see Joram, the son of Ahab, in Jezreel, because he was sick. And then it cuts scene, and we'll come back to that very scene in just a moment. So Joram is, I don't know, he's got some arrow, maybe wounds in his shoulders or something. He needs to go get doctored up. Brother-in-law Ahaziah from Judah may have been fighting in battle with him. He says, I'm going to pay my brother-in-law a visit. I like my brother-in-laws. I can imagine if they got shot in battle, I would go visit them. He does that. He takes a care package. And in just a minute, we're going to cut back to this scene. Ahaziah taking his care package to his brother-in-law, Joram. Okay, but until then, we cut to Ramoth Gilead. Now, Ramoth Gilead is where the king of Judah, Ahaziah, his armies are at. And here's where we're going to be introduced to the third character, Jehu. We've already met Elisha. We've met Haziel. Now we're going to meet Jehu. Chapter 9 and verse 1. And Elisha the prophet called one of the sons of the prophets and said to him, Get yourself ready. Take this flask of oil in your hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. Now when you arrive at that place, look there for Jehu the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, and go in and make him rise up from among his associates and take, uh, take him to an inner room. Then take the flask of oil and pour it on his head and say, Thus says the Lord, I have anointed you king over Israel. Then open the door and flee and don't delay. And so he does this. Now, I believe the reason that they go into a private room is because, well, think about it. The real king of Israel is wounded. Jehu is a captain or a commander. I don't know what rank he held, but he is a commander of the armies of King Joram who is wounded, member at home. And these other officers are sitting here just chillaxing with him. And if this messenger of Elisha comes and just dumps oil on Jehu's head and says, you're king, you could imagine the risk that that might be taking, right? In the midst of other commanders of King Joram's army. Well, anyway, so he takes him to this inner room. He declares to him revelations from God, says, you are going to be king of Israel in place of Joram, and you're going to kill Joram, and you're going to exterminate the house of Ahab. Do you understand? Dump some oil. Jehu comes out. I can imagine he puts his helmet back on, but he's got oil just running down, and his hair is wet, and people are like, what just happened? And so he, uh, they ask, what did that madman have to say? And this uh, King Jehu now is King Jehu. He, he tells him. He says, well, he anointed me king of Israel. And it's from the Lord, the God of Israel. And they all just accept it. So maybe they were uh, hesitant to do this openly in front of everybody, the messenger and Jehu. But after they open it up to everybody, here's, here's the cat out of the bag. I don't think they really like their master, King Joram. I don't think Joram was the poster boy of Israel at this time, at least not in the army ranks. And so they all just put down their cloaks and have them, uh, they hail to him and they say, hail King Jehu. And they just accept this conspiracy against, against King Joram, who's home uh, healing his wounds. And so now the real fun begins. And this is where things start to get crazy. Where are we at here? Let me turn my page. We're going to jump down all the way to um, the end of verse 13. Jehu is king. And we jump now back to cut scene where Joram is healing from his wounds with his brother-in-law Ahaziah. Verse 14. 
So Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, conspired against Joram. Now Joram had been defending Ramoth Gilead, he and all Israel, against Haziel, king of Syria. But King Joram had returned to Jezreel to recover from the wounds which the Syrians had inflicted on him when he fought with Haziel, king of Syria. And Jehu said, If you are so minded, let no one leave or escape from the city to go and tell it in Jezreel. So don't let anybody in King Joram's house know that I've been anointed king is what he's saying. So Jehu rode in a chariot and went to Jezreel, for Joram was laid up there, and Ahaziah king of Judah had come down to see Joram. Now a watchman stood on the tower in Jezreel, and you can imagine watchmen. They go days without seeing anything, and suddenly they see something. And this has got to be exciting for the watchman. Finally, some, some action. You know, must have been a boring job. And a watchman stood on the tower in Jezreel, and he saw the company of Jehu as he came, and he said, I see a company of men. And Joram said, Get a horseman. And, and send him to meet them and let him say, is it peace? And so there's this small little caravan and Joram has no clue what it is because again, he hasn't gotten news yet and he sends a watchman, is it peace? What that's saying is, are you coming on peaceful terms or are you coming with hostility in mind? And Joram, so he tells him that verse 18, so the horseman went to meet him and said, thus says the king, is it peace? And Jehu said, what have you to do with peace? Turn around and follow me. So the watchman reported saying, the messenger went to them, but, but he's not coming back. <laughs> and, and then he sent a second horseman who came to them and said, thus says the king, is it peace? And Jehu answered, what have you to do with peace? Turn around and follow me. So the watchman reported saying, he went out, but he's not coming back either. <laughs> and King Joel must be racking his brains. What is going on? And he doesn't know that if he goes out there, he's going to regret it. But he gets on his horse. With, he's still got bandages on. And he goes out there himself. Then Joram, verse 21, said, Make ready. And his chariot was made ready. Then Joram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, went out. So both these guys, each in his chariot. And they went out to meet Jehu and met him on the property of Naboth the Jezreelite. Now remember Naboth? Maybe some of you do. Naboth was the innocent man who owned a vineyard next door to Ahab. And Ahab really wanted that vineyard. And he said, no, I, I like my grapes. And so Ahab had a pouty party. And Jezebel saw him sulking. And when she heard what it was, she went about her own way to kill Naboth and all of his rightful heirs, as we'll find out in this account. And they seize Naboth's vineyard. So it's not just by circumstance that they are at Naboth's vineyard, at least where it used to be. Now it happened when Joram saw Jehu that he said, is it peace, Jehu? So he answered, what peace as long as the harlotries of your mother Jezebel and her witchcraft are so many? Then Joram turned around and fled and said to Ahaziah, treachery, Ahaziah. And, and, said, uh, and now Jehu drew his bow with full strength. And shot Jehoram between his arms, and the arrow came out at his heart, and he sank down in his chariot. Then Jehu said to Bidkar, his captain, Pick him up and throw him into the tract of the field of Naboth the Jezreelite. For remember, when you and I were riding together behind Ahab his father, that the Lord laid this burden upon him, surely I saw yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his son, says the Lord, and I will repay you in this plot, says the Lord. Now therefore take and throw him on the plot of ground, according to the word of the Lord." Fitting irony. Now, about this next portion is verses 27 through 29 on the outline. I'm sorry, here's the outline. Um, the first mission was to kill Joram. And within that mission now is Ahaziah, the king of Judah, the brother-in-law. Remember, verses 27 through 29. Let's read it. But when Ahaziah, king of Judah, saw this, he fled by the road to Beth Hagen. So Je uh, Jehu pursued him and said, shoot him also in the chariot. And they shot him at the ascent of Gur, which is by Iblium. Then he fled to Megiddo and died there. And his servants carried him in the chariot to Jerusalem and buried him in his tomb with his fathers in the city of David. In the eleventh year of Joram, the son of Ahab, Ahaziah became king over Judah. Now I want to stop and make a little comment here. And that's King Ahaziah really was not the chief culprit in all this. He was a bad guy. What made him bad? He rubbed shoulders with Joram, the son of Ahab. That's what made him bad. Now, I, th I thought that Ahab was the bad guy. I thought Joram was the bad guy. 
This teaches you the consequences of unity and diversity. When you think it's okay to rub shoulders with the enemy. And you can rub shoulders and not get dirty. This is the consequences of that. And when you mix bags with religious error, on the day of judgment, you can't just wash your hands clean like Pilate and say, I'm innocent. It doesn't work that way. We'll come back to that in just a little bit. Verse 30. So Ahaziah is dead. Mission one is almost fulfilled. We still got one left. Jezebel. She's out there somewhere. This part is really interesting, but also very violent. Verse 30. Now when Jehu had come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she put paint on her eyes and adorned her head and looked through a window. Remember in that sermon about the immoral woman, and I talked about the face paint of Jezebel? That's where I was getting this. She put her makeup on, all gaudy, to go see Jehu. And she put her head out the window and said, woohoo. And uh, she wasn't saying that when it was over. We're about to find out what happened. Then as Jehu entered at the gate, she said, is it peace, Zimra, murderer of your master? So she's heard what's going on. And he looked up at the window and said, who is on my side? Who? And so he's calling out the people around Jezebel. So two of the three eunuchs looked out at him. Then he said, throw her down. So they threw her down, and some of her blood spattered on the wall and on the horses, and he trampled her. And when she had, he had gone into the castle, he ate and drank. <laughs> She's fresh, and he's having lunch now. Doesn't bother him. Then he said, go now, see to this accursed woman and bury her, for she was a king's daughter. <laughs> had lunch at her disposal, but she was a king's daughter, so go bury her. And verse 35, so they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than the skull of the feet and the palms of her hands. Therefore, they came back and told Jehu, and Jehu said, this is the word of the Lord, which he spoke by the servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, on the plot of ground at Jezreel, dogs shall eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the corpse of Jezebel shall be as refuse on the surface of the field in the plot at Jezreel. So they shall say, not say, here lies Jezebel. That's what a wicked woman gets, and she deserves it, and God is just by giving it to her. The wrath of God? Yes. Unholy? No. Unjust? No. She got exactly what she deserved. And on the day of judgment, you will either get exactly what you deserve, or you will not because you are washed in the blood of a lamb and have given faithfulness to him unto the death. We get now to chapter 10, and this is not over. Mission 1 is accomplished, but we go on to mission 2. Killing the man himself, Joram and Ahaziah, that's not good enough. Because they still have family alive. And God said he was going to destroy the whole family of Ahab. And so in mission 2, Ahaziah's family and Ahab's family are up next on the chopping block. So let's get to chapter 10 and verse 1. Now Ahab had 70 sons. A lot of sons. I guess he had more than one wife. And Jehu wrote and sent letters to Samaria, to the rulers of Jezreel, to the elders, and to those who reared Ahab's son, saying, Now as soon as this letter comes to you, since your master's sons are with you, and you have chariots and horses, a fortified city also, and weapons, choose the best qualified of your master's sons, set him on his father's throne, and fight for your master's house. So basically, if I'm going to kill y'all, at least let's make it a fair fight. And so get your best and put them up there. Verse 4, But they were exceedingly afraid, as you should be. And said, look, two kings couldn't stand up to this guy. How then can we stand? And he who was in charge of the house and he who was in charge of the city, the elders also, and those who reared the sons sent to Jehu saying, we're your servants and we'll do all you tell us. Now, these were not the 70 sons. These were the people around the 70 sons. They're saying, we'll do whatever you tell us, but we'll not make anyone king. Do what is good in your sight. Then Jehu wrote a second letter. If you are for me and you'll obey my voice, take the heads of the men, your master's sons, and come to me at Jezreel by this time tomorrow. Heads will roll. Now the king's sons, 70 persons, were the great men of the city who were rearing them. So it was when the letter came to them that they took the king's sons and slaughtered 70 persons, put their heads in baskets, and sent them to Jehu at Jezreel. It's done. Then a messenger came and told him, saying, they have brought the heads of the king's sons. And he said, lay them in two heaps at the entrance of the gate until morning. I want everybody to see it. I want everybody to see the sons of Ahab's heads when they walk in and out of the gate to do commerce on Monday. 
So it was in the morning that he went out and stood and said to all the people, heads are sitting right there, you are righteous. Indeed, I conspired against my master and killed him, but who killed all these? Know now that nothing shall fall to the earth of the word of the Lord, which the Lord spoke concerning the house of Ahab. For the Lord has done what he spoke by his servant Elijah. So Jehu killed all who remained of the house of Ahab in Jezreel and all his great men and his close acquaintances and his priests until he left him none remaining. Remember what we talked about rubbing shoulders with the bad guy? Didn't matter if you were just the king's brother-in-law, all his mighty men, all his close acquaintances. If you were on a certified letter with King Ahab, you lost your head. There were some people that were fleeing for their life and they were... Who can stand up to this guy? The house of Ahab said. Now we'll read on a little bit more and then I want to stop and make another comment. And he rose and departed and went to Samaria. On the way at Beth Eked, I guess, of the shepherds, Jehu met with the brothers of Ahaziah now. Ahaziah, the second part of that mission. A king of Judah and said, Who are you? And they answered, We're the brothers of Ahaziah. We've come down to get the sons of the king and the sons of the queen mother, or to greet them. And he said, take them alive. So they took them alive and killed them at the well of Beth Echid. Forty-two men, and he left none of them. Same thing, but Ahaziah's sons. Now, when he had departed from there, he met Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him. And he greeted him and said to him, is, it your, heart, is your heart right as my heart is toward your heart? And Jehonadab answered, it is. Jehu said, if it is, give me your hand. So he gave him his hand, and he took him up to him in the chariot. Then he said, Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. So they had him ride in his chariot. And when he came to Samaria, he killed all who remained to Ahab in Samaria, till he destroyed them, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke to Elijah. Now there's a lot of gore in the little sentence right there. We've read a lot, but there's a lot more in there that's between the lines. And he doesn't show any mercy. Now, what I want to stop to tell you about right here, as we've been saying about rubbing shoulders with the bad guy, let's focus on the bad guy for just a minute. And I want to talk to you who are mothers and fathers, and will be mothers and fathers one day. I'm not, but if I ever am, this applies just as much to me. On the day of judgment, think about King Ahab, a father, and what just happened to his sons. On the day of judgment, if you set the wrong example for your children and you didn't make it right, like King Ahab, and if you failed to lead your children and you didn't make it right, you're going to answer to God on the day of judgment why they're in hell. You can go to church your whole life and you're going to answer to God on the day of judgment if you didn't make it right. Now I understand that there are faithful Christians whose children are not faithful. Some of them are here. And you've done everything you can to make it right. And they're still not Christians. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people who failed and they're either too proud, I don't know, they're too proud to admit it, whatever. And they will not admit that they did something wrong and try to reach out to their children and tell them, listen, I messed up. And I'm telling you now, and try to appeal to them on the day of judgment, Ahab's children died, not because of something they did, because of what their daddy did. And that's a lesson to us. It's a very sobering lesson. And it, that's one of the reasons why I'm terrified of God, I have a healthy respect of God. Let's keep on reading. Verse 18. Then Jehu gathered all the people together and said to them, so we've passed mission, before I go any further, we've passed mission two, that's checked off. Now we're on number six, mission three, kill all Baal worshipers. <laughs> it's like he's got a checklist. Kill all Baal worshipers. Okay, up next. And so we go now to verse 18. Then Jehu gathered all the people together and said to them, Ahab served Baal a little, Jehu will serve him much. Now I want to stop here for just a minute. Jehu is obviously lying. God anointed Jehu to carry out judgment on Ahab does not mean that God approved of Jehu or anything that he does necessarily in the process. God used evil men to accomplish his purposes on many occasions. So when he lies here, God's not necessarily approving of lying. 
Now therefore call to me all the prophets of Baal, all his servants, and all his priests. Let no one be missing, for I have a great sacrifice for Baal. Whoever is missing shall not live. But Jehu acted deceptively with the intent of destroying the worshipers of Baal. And Jehu said, Proclaim a solemn assembly for Baal. So they proclaimed it. Then Jehu sent throughout all Israel, and all the worshipers of Baal came, so that there was not a man left who did not come. So they came in the temple of Baal, and the temple of Baal was full from one end to the other. And he said, uh, the one, uh, I'm sorry, he said to the one in charge of the wardrobe, bring out vestments for all the worshipers of Baal. So he brought out vestments for them. Then Jehu and Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, went into the temple of Baal and said to the worshipers of Baal, search and see that no servants of the Lord are here with you, but only the worshipers of Baal. You know what those vestments were? They were so that when they went in there to kill him, they didn't make any mistakes. <laughs> this is like the mark of the beast in Revelation 13. This is an identifier of the people of God and the people of Baal. In verse 24, So they went in to offer sacrifices and burnt offerings. Now Jehu had appointed for himself 80 men on the outside. And he said, If any of the men whom I have brought into your hands escape, whoever lets him escape, it shall be his life for the life of the other. And then those 80 men go in there and they start hacking every one of those Baal worshippers. And the Bible says there were no more Baal worshippers at the end of the day. <laughs> Again, just, righteous, holy, people got what they deserved, and nobody can point a finger at God and accuse him of ill-doing. This is judgment. This is what it looks like. It's graphic, and that people get what they deserve. We jump now down to verse 29. Mission 3 is accomplished, and we get to the epitaph of Jehu, a summary of his life. What's on his headstone? I told you he wasn't a perfect guy. God uses evil men to accomplish his purposes and then throws them out when they don't give him faithfulness to their cells. So we start at verse, I want to say here, verse 29. However, Jehu did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel sin, that is, from the golden calves that were at Bethel and Dan. And the Lord said to Jehu, Because you have done well in doing what is right in my sight, and have done to the house of Ahab all that was in my heart, your son shall sit on the throne of Israel to the fourth generation. But Jehu took no heed to the walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart, for he did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, who had made Israel sin. And so it's not a fairy tale ending, unfortunately. I don't really think there's anything about this that's fairy tale-ish. And that's kind of the end of the story. Now, we're not done. Because we've read this story, we've done all the major reading, we still have some more reading to do, because we want to take away some stuff that we can put in our back pocket and say, let's make this practical. What can I take with me? Because really none of this is about hell. We didn't read about hell. I told you at the beginning of the lesson this is a sermon about hell. It's a sermon about the judgment of God. And we have learned about the judgment of God. And this word picture of God's character and what his will is for the wicked who do not re who refuse to submit to him. That's what we can take away about hell. Some, some key things. So first thing I want to take with you, and I'll give you the passages for each point here. I have four takeaways. The first is that God's promises of judgment are sure. And we learn that very well in the book uh, on this story of Jew killing the house of Ahab. Now I want to go back to 1 Kings 22 to show you this. 1 Kings 22 and verse 21. We have not read this yet, I don't believe. I'm sorry, it's chapter 21. I have a typo in my notes, I just realized. 1 Kings 21, verse 21 through 24. We have read this, but I want to emphasize some wording here. This is when Elijah gives the initial pronouncement of judgment on Ahab and Jezebel. Now the point is, God's promises of judgment are sure. You can take them to the bank... You can invest stock in them. When God says something's going to happen, it's going to happen. Verse 21, he says, I will bring calamity on you, Ahab. I will take away your posterity, and I will cut off from Ahab every male. Jumping down to verse 22, I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam. Verse 23, and concerning Jer Jezebel, the Lord also spoke, saying the dogs will eat whoever belongs to Ahab and dies in the city. He is leaving no uncertain terms. I am going to destroy you, annihilate you. And what do we read? 
It took a little time. It took two generations. But God did exactly what he said he would do. We know by looking at 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 10, we read this already. This singular verse ties back to that. 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 10 says, Know nothing or know now that nothing will fall to the earth of the Lord of the Lord, which the Lord spoke concerning the house of Ahab, for the Lord has done what he spoke by his servant Elijah. When God says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, you don't have to turn here. A familiar verse says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise. And there He is talking about hell. He will send people to hell who do not submit to Him. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, the Bible says about those who do not obey the gospel, These will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power when He comes in that day. Talking about the day of judgment. They will go up in flames. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 22, where he in fact is talking about Jezebel as a symbol for sexual immorality in the church. He says, indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into the great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds, I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts and I will give to each one of you according to your works. When God says he's going to judge you according to your works, they're going to come out on the table on the day of judgment and you will be judged by them. Do you understand? God is not joking and he's not playing games. And when we live our lives like God will not judge us according to our works, we are fools. Because God's judgments are sure. You can take that to the bank and invest stock in it, like I said. God's judgments will come to pass. That's why it's so imperative that we heed the gospel and we heed the warning because he is not slack concerning his promises of hell. The second thing we can take to the bank is that God sees the blood of the innocent. God sees the blood of the innocent. It says there in 2 Kings chapter 9 and verse 7, you shall strike down the house of Ahab, your master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. He remembered Naboth. Jezebel may have forgotten who Naboth was, but God didn't forget his name. In 2 Kings 9, same chapter, verse 26, Jehu is talking for God, and he says, Surely I saw yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his son, says the Lord, and I will repay you in this plot, says the Lord. Now take him and throw him in the plot of ground, Joram's carcass. God saw the blood of innocence that was killed in Naboth, and he did not forget. It took several years. Sometimes things don't happen the way, the way we want them, when we want them, how we want them, but God's will is done. It echoes Exodus chapter 3 and verse 7 whenever it describes there God talking to Moses and he heard Israel crying in the land of Egypt because of the death of their innocent children that were killed by the king of Egypt. It reminds me of Matthew chapter 2 and verse 16. In Matthew chapter 2 and verse 16, remember at the birth of Christ, he was a young child. Then Herod, when he was, saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all their districts from the two years old and under, according to the time when he had determined from the wise men. Then was fulfilled, which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, All these babies dead. A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted, because they're no more. When I read the story of Jehu saying, God saw the blood of Naboth today, and God heard the children of Israel crying out in Egypt because of the death of their children, and he heard that Rachel, Israel, crying for her children whenever they were killed by it, it makes me think of abortion today. It does, and this is, of course, in the news, so I think it's appropriate. But I think of God seeing the blood of the unborn, and they have names to God. And he will avenge the blood of every baby killed in the womb. Every doctor, every nurse, assistant, every back alley clinic with a hanger, every Planned Parenthood corporate office, God will repay. You can take that to the bank. Of these types of wicked people, Elisha's delegated prophet said, The dogs shall eat Jezebel in the plot of the ground at Jezreel, and there will be none to bury her. 
They went to bury her. There's nothing but bones from the palms of her hand and blood spattered on the wall. If you think my application is too plain and too pointed, you're not going to like judgment. And I will say this because it's possible, like I said about parents, you can repent and you can change and you can make that right with God. You can and you can be saved. I don't know the hearts of anyone and what you've done. Usually, many times in the church, abortions happen and they're private and nobody else knows about it. If you have committed an abortion, you can be forgiven of that. But you must repent. That's what God told the church in Revelation 2 about the immorality they had taken or committed. I think in Matthew 25, verse 40, Jesus was talking about the day of judgment and he said about, you know, have you fed my servant? Have you clothed them? Have you visited those who were sick? He said, Surely I say to you, and as much as you did it to the one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. God takes it personal when people injure the blood of his innocent. It's like you did it to God. And he feels it whenever these wicked people out here kill the unborn innocent. And use any other point of application that you want. That's just the one that happens all the time right under our noses. Number three, there's no peace for the wicked. No peace. The Bible says in 2 Kings chapter 9 and verse 19, then, Jehus, or I'm sorry, then Joram sent out a second horseman who came to them and said, Thus says the king, is it peace? We on peace? Is this, this is going to be a good time? And he said, What have you to do with peace? No, it's not for peace. There is no peace for the wicked. Isaiah 57 verse 21 says, There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. doesn't get more clearer than that. In James chapter 4 and verse 4, now this one hits home because this one is very applicable to me and you. Talking to the church, James says, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Like, this is a rhetorical question. Do you not know this? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And have we learned anything tonight about what God does to his enemies? You say, well, I'm not Jezebel. Have you become a friend of the world in some other way? Because you're an enemy of God. The fourth point is that hell is graphic. If this is just a word picture of what hell is like, then the real thing you don't want to know. Like I said, if I was too plain for you tonight, you don't want to be on there at Judgment Day. You'll be there. You just won't want to be there. Because hell is going to be graphic. I want to read a couple of these that we already read about the nation of Israel as a nation. 2 Kings 8, verse 12, And Haziel said, Why, my Lord, are you weeping? Elijah said, or Elisha said, the servant, Because I know the evil that you'll do to the children of Israel. Their strongholds you'll set on fire. Their young men you will kill with a sword. And you'll dash their children and rip open their women with children. That was God's judgment against a wicked Wicked nation who he had been long suffering with, long suffering with. You cannot accuse God of being impatient and not giving enough rope. Second Kings chapter 10 and verse 7, remember? So it was when the letter came to them that they took the king's sons and slaughtered 70 persons, put their heads in baskets, and sent them to him at Jezreel. In Mark chapter 9, verse 47, Jesus said, And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. He says that because hell is graphic. So all this, I'm done. All this I, I give to you, and I just want to leave you with a sobering plea. If you're playing church today, you know what that means. If you're playing church today, I exhort you to stop it. Stop playing church. Remember the takeaways from the study of Jehu. God's promises of judgment are sure. God sees the blood of the innocent. There is no peace for the wicked. And hell will be graphic. 
And if it would do you good to be disturbed by a word picture of hell tonight, I hope that you're disturbed and I hope that you lose sleep. I really do because it will be for your best interest. And if you need to be comforted and reassured that God sees you in your suffering, I hope that you are reassured and comforted tonight because God does see you in your suffering. And if you need to repent, I hope that this has motivated you to repent while we sing.